Hey, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name's Brina. Today is Saturday, so that means it's another episode of Makeup and Murder. Although, I'm not really loving the title, so I might change it up. If you have any suggestions to what I should change it to, let me know in the comments. But let's just go right into the story. Today we're going to be talking about James Joseph Richardson. James was born December 26th, 1935. And other than that, we're not really going to talk about his childhood or his upbringing at all because that is not at all what today's story is about. So James and his wife, Annie Mae Richardson, lived in Arcadia, Florida. The two had five children together and Annie Mae had two children from a previous marriage. So in total, they had seven children and the kids were ranged in age from two to eight. James and Annie Mae worked on the orange groves in Florida. So while they were at work, the older four children would go to school while the younger three stayed home with the next door neighbor, Bessie Reese, who was their babysitter. And the day of October 25th, 1967 was no different. James and Annie Mae went to work, the older four children went to school, and the younger three stayed home with their babysitter. A typical day for the Richardson children was to come home for lunch. So that is what the older four did. They came home where the younger three children were getting ready to have lunch. The babysitter, Bessie, warmed up the meal of rice, beans, and grits that Annie Mae had prepared for the children the night before. And once they were finished with lunch, they went about their normal days, they went back to school. But when the older four children got to school, they all suddenly became violently ill. A teacher had noticed this. She brought it to the attention of the principal who decided that the children probably needed to go to the hospital. And they quickly realized it was only the Richardson children who were being affected by this sudden illness. So one of the teachers went to their house to check on the other three children and that's when she found them all violently ill as well. So she took them to the hospital to meet up with their other four siblings. Now somebody had alerted James and Annie Mae that they had a child who was ill and in the hospital and that one of the parents needed to be there with the child. Little did James and Annie Mae know that when they arrived at the hospital, six of their seven children would be dead. Eight-year-old Betty, seven-year-old Alice, six-year-old Susie, five-year-old Doreen, four-year-old Vanessa, and two-year-old James Jr. were all deceased when the parents arrived at the hospital. The only living child, three-year-old Diane, would pass away the next day. So obviously police were alerted to the fact that seven children from the same home all became violently ill and six of them had died. So Joseph H. Manugan from the Arcadia Police arrived at the hospital to assess the situation. He asked James and Annie Mae if it was okay that he go to their home to look around for anything suspicious because it had been determined that all seven children had been poisoned with organic phosphate pesticide parathion? 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 I don't know. Joseph went to search their house, but he only found insecticide, which did not have any of the same chemicals that was determined to have killed the children. So he went back to the hospital and now the Arcadia police chief, Richard Barnard, as well as the DeSoto County Sheriff, Frank Klein, both headed to the Richardson home to do an investigation of their own. Upon entering the Richardson home, they did notice a odd smell, but just as Joseph Manugan, they were not able to find any poison either. At this point, Sheriff Klein has come to his own conclusion of what happened to the children. He believes it was probably a pesticide that they were poisoned with. So he went out back and decided to search the shed, but once again, he found nothing. The day that the poisonings happened, the Richardson home, as well as the shed behind their house, was searched five times and no poison was found until the next day. Police received an anonymous tip that somebody had found a two pound sack of parathion, 
Paratheome. I don't think I'm saying that right. And the shed behind the Richardson home. When police arrived, they found the babysitter, Bessie Reese, who told them that a man named Charlie Smith decided he was going to search the shed himself. He thought he could find it. And what do you know? He opens a window and immediately finds the bag of Paratheon. Paratheon? And police conclude that obviously whoever put this bag of Paratheon <laughs> in the shed must have been the one who poisoned the children. Two days after the incident on October 27th, Sheriff Klein broke the news that apparently James had spoken with a insurance salesman the night before the children were murdered about getting life insurance on the kids. But when they tried to get statements from James and the insurance salesman about this, they found conflicting stories and they were never able to quite figure out what exactly had transpired between James and the insurance salesman the night before the murders. So at this point, police have basically no evidence and their only lead is that they believe James Richardson killed his kids. The funerals for the seven children were held at the end of the week and let's just say it was an extremely emotional time for James and Annie Mae. Annie Mae actually passed out during the services and James broke down in tears, just wailing uncontrollably. Everyone there believed that this was just a very emotional, grieving father. Nobody in attendance of the funeral believed he had anything to do with the murders. But Sheriff Klein had other suspicions. The funeral was basically a giant media circus. It was covered by national news magazines, television and radio networks, and this put not only the Richardson family, but also the police force working the case right in the center of the public eye. Arcadia Police Chief Richard Barnard later told one of James's lawyers, quote, Klein saw the chance to make a big name for himself. He needed to make an arrest. Real bad. Two days after the children's funeral, Sheriff Klein arrested James Richardson and charged him with seven counts of murder. Meanwhile, Chief Barnard held his stance believing that James was innocent. He stated, quote, there just is no case against that man. Subsequently, the mur murder warrant was dropped and James and Annie Mae were both charged with child neglect. The day after this happened, Sheriff Klein held a press conference where he announced that not only was James guilty of murdering his seven children presently, but that he had also had five other children who died under mysterious circumstances in another Florida city. But these accusations were never confirmed. It is never even confirmed that James had other children outside of the seven that he had with Annie Mae. Klein went on to say that James's motive for the murders was to collect the $14,000 life insurance policies that still nobody even knew if they were in effect. That $14,000 in 1967 equates to about $109,000 in today's money. So, I mean, that's a lot of money, but would you really kill your seven kids over it? I don't think so. Judge Hayes, who was set to preside over the case, said that both James and Annie Mae had taken a lie detector and that James's results showed that he had knowledge of the poisoning, which in the judge's mind made James guilty. So it kind of seems like James isn't going to get a fair trial here, even from the beginning. Now, keep in mind that this Judge Hayes was a very prominent member of the community. He'd been a judge for more than 30 years, and everyone in Arcadia held his opinion to a very high standard, and basically they just believed everything Judge Hayes had to say. On November 2nd of 1967, Judge Hayes ordered Sheriff Klein to formally charge James Richardson with the murder of his seven children. Now, remember how I said that this was like a whole big media circus? Well, a 30-year-old white lawyer by the name of John Robinson had witnessed what was going on in Arcadia with James. So he got in touch with the NAACP in Florida and he basically instructed them to go to James and 
offer services to him. So the NAACP presented him with a list of attorneys and they asked him who he would like to have represent him. James decided to allow the NAACP to help him out and he chose John Robinson to be his attorney. When John first met James, he could immediately tell that James had a deep love for his children and he 100% believed James was innocent and that he could have had absolutely nothing to do with murdering his kids because he just loved them too much. During this first meeting, James also informed John of how Sheriff Klein had been treating him. Frank Klein had been getting physical with James. He would push him. He called him the N-word. And he was just basically questioning him in an all around mean and aggressive way. And this was happening daily. Klein even informed James that if, you know, it's a story as old as times, Sheriff Klein told James that if he would just confess that he would be let off easy, things would be so much better for him. But James did not take the bait. He held his stance that he was innocent. And eventually James found out that Sheriff Klein had gone as far as putting a bug in his cell. So every time his lawyer would come and meet with him, Sheriff Klein would listen in on their conversations, hoping to overhear a confession, but that never happened. Eventually, James found the bug and threw it out. When James was first arrested, his bail was set at $100,000. Obviously, working in the Orange Groves, he would not be able to afford this. So his lawyer, John, worked at getting his bail lowered and he was able to get it down to $75,000, at which point James was released on bail. So now we're getting ready for the trial to begin and three former cellmates of James, Arnell Washington, James Weaver, and James Cunningham all came forward claiming that James had confessed to all three of them that he told them that he had killed his kids. So now the judge decides to revoke James's bail and he ordered James to be jailed once again. Then the judge asked for a change in venue, which was something that James's lawyer, John, was very happy about because let's just say um, the South um, did not have a very good reputation for fairly prosecuting black people back in the day. I mean, who knew? To John's dismay, the trial was only moved one county over, so it didn't really do much, but it just slightly gave them a less polluted jury pool to pick from because like I said, this was a very big thing. Like it was widely covered in the news, so everybody knew about James Richardson and the seven children. James Richardson's trial began on May 27th, 1968, and the jury was all white. This was something that John Robinson had tried to challenge numerous times, but in the end, he was unable to secure a different jury. During the trial, Sheriff Klein once again claimed he had evidence that James had killed three more of his children at a different time, which earlier was five, now it's three. Seems a little suspicious if you ask me. And he also claimed that James had another three children who became violently ill, but did not die. So now it's six kids, but only three died. Things just aren't adding up here, buddy. And there is still no evidence supporting the fact that James had any more kids or that any more of his kids had died. I got too hot and had to take my hoodie off, so. All right, so now we're getting into the testimonies during trial. First, we're gonna start with the babysitter. You remember her, right, Bessie Reese? Well, she testified that she divided the meal Annie Mae had prepared for the children evenly amongst all seven of them, and that that's all she did. She said, oh yeah, I didn't poison them, so don't look at me, you know, not suspicious at all. And while doing her testimony, it came out that Bessie Reese was presently on parole for something that the prosecution did not want the jury to know. That's all the further. They took it with the questioning about her being on parole. They asked her about the miraculous discovery of the Paratheon, Paratheon bag. And she told them basically the same story she told cops the day that it was found that 
Charlie Smith decided he wanted to look for the poison and he miracul miraculously found it right away. Not suspicious at all, but she was implying that maybe Charlie knew right where to find it for a reason. Then the next day they brought Gerald Purvis onto the stand and he was the insurance salesman. He testified about meeting with James the night before the children died and it is still very unclear as to whether James specifically called Gerald to his home or if Gerald was just going door to door. But either way, Gerald said that he and James had talked about family plans. James informed Gerald that he did not have the money to pay for the premiums, so Gerald decided he would come back the next week and maybe they could get an insurance plan in place then. So Gerald is saying that he left there without selling James any insurance and that the children still did not have any life insurance on them. But John Treadwell, the assistant state's attorney, kept trying to make it sound like Gerald was saying that he knew for sure he was coming back in a week and that the plans were in place. James just couldn't pay him quite yet. So he was insisting that Gerald was setting up the plans and that they were in place. But Gerald was saying, no, 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 that's not what happened. There were no plans in place. The kids were not insured. But John Treadwell just was trying to twist his words around. After Gerald Purvis, several law enforcement officers testified that during the search of the Richardson home, which keep in mind, the home had been searched five times the day that the children were poisoned and no poison was found, which is exactly what the law enforcement officers testified to. Now it's finally time for Charlie Smith to testify. Remember, he's the guy who found the poison the Paratheon, which was what they said poisoned the kids. He told the exact same story as Bessie Reese and he was quickly excused. So at this point, all the evidence has been presented. I mean, there's no solid evidence in this case. It's just a bunch of eyewitness testimony. So the jury retired to consider very little evidence. And after just 30 minutes, they came back on May 31st, 1968 with a unanimous verdict of guilty. Now, you might be wondering how they quickly came to that verdict, and I am as well. The jury stated, death with premeditation at the hands of James and party or parties unknown, and they recommended the death penalty. Following the case, Charlie Smith was arrested as a material witness, and his bond was set at $2,000. No other witnesses were jailed in this case. Yet, Arcadia Chief of Police Richard Barnard still believed that even though James was convicted, there was still no case against him. James Richardson was given the death penalty and he went on to spend the next five years of his life on death row. While he was on death row, an attorney and author named Mark Lane began visiting James. James asked Mark if he would represent him and Mark agreed. And thus began Mark's exhaustive investigation into proving James's innocence. In 1970, Mark published what he found in the book Arcadia, and this is when it was revealed what Betty Reese was on parole for. She was a convicted murderer. Yes, you heard that correctly. She was a convicted murderer on parole during the time the children were murdered, and nobody looked at her any more than what they had. Like, they just took her word for it, even though she was the one home with the kids when they were poisoned, they just believed her. The book also indicated that James and Annie Mae were innocent, which was what most people had believed all along. Then in 1972, James's life was saved when the US Supreme Court ruled that death penalties in the US at the time were unconstitutional. So. James was removed from death row and put into general population in the prison, and his sentence was commuted from death to life with the possibility of parole in 1993. Now we're going to jump to 1988. You remember Bessie Reese, the babysitter, right? Yeah, well, remember how I said she was on parole for murder? Well, get this. Bessie Reese is now living in an assisted living home, suffering from Alzheimer's, and Nursing staff had heard her say more than a hundred times, I killed those kids. 
I killed those kids. But yeah, nobody took her seriously because she was suffering from Alzheimer's. So this convicted fel felon who was convicted of murder served these seven children a meal that they were poisoned by and now she is confessing to the murders 21 years later and nobody's taking her seriously. But that's not it. It turns out Bessie Reese was holding a little bit of a grudge against James because see her third husband, yes, her third husband, had recently left her and she suspected that James had helped him. So she was mad at James. Bessie was known for her jealousy and holding grudges. And as it turns out, not only had she been convicted of killing one of her husbands, so her first husband she shot, she was convicted for that, for killing him. Her second husband, turns out he was poisoned. Yeah. Yeah, you heard that right. He was poisoned. But Bessie was never charged with that, although police did strongly suspect her of the poisoning. Bessie died in 1992 of Alzheimer's before police were ever able to investigate her claims further. So I think somebody dropped the ball on that one. And also by 1992, two of the three cellmates who had come forward stating that James confessed to them had died, but the final third one the other two had already recanted their statements saying that James never actually confessed to them. And now the third one is also coming forward saying James did not confess to him, but instead he stated that he was offered a lighter sentence in return for testifying against James. Now, as it turns out, big surprise here, the investigation into the children's deaths were not done well. Leads were never pursued, such as Bessie Reese. Critical questions were not answered, like why did this po poison just mirac miraculously show up out of nowhere? How did James kill his kids when he wasn't, he was like 30 minutes away on the orange groves with his wife? And there were plenty of inconsistencies throughout this case that were just never resolved. So on October 25th of 1989, a hearing was held in Arcadia where James's lawyers presented all the insu insufficient evidence and a testimony that was used to convict him. They presented evidence of a cover-up by Sheriff Frank Klein, State Attorney Frank Schwab, his deputy John Treadwell, and as well as Judge Hayes. So, so they're saying all four of these men were in on the cover-up together and I mean it kind of fits. That's, that's how James ended up getting convicted. His supposed motive being the life insurance, which did not exist, and the witnesses who were now very easily discredited. This led the chief prosecutor in Miami, Janet Reno, to conduct her own investigation. She found evidence that the prisoners who testified that James confessed to them had actually been beaten into cooperation. So everything that was used to prosecute James at this point is just not good. <laughs> like they're finding out that the evidence is really not on the state side here and it's looking more and more like James is innocent. And it was determined that James obviously did not have a fair trial. And on April 25th, 1989, he was released into the custody of his lawyers. Following his release, James found work at a health resort but his job there did not last very long because James was suffering from health issues of his own. While he was in prison, he had suffered from a heart attack and had to have open heart surgery. And he was also just really struggling with mental issues because he was in prison for like 21 years, wrongfully convicted of murdering his children. Like not only did he lose his kids, he lost his everything. So that just took a very strong mental toll on him. And while his wife, Annie Mae, had been very loyal and faithful to him throughout most of his prison sentence, she divorced him shortly after his release. Then in August of 1995, James suffered from another heart attack. He was at his home in Jacksonville, Florida when it happened. And then he was life flighted to Wichita, Kansas where he underwent emergency treatment by Dr. Joseph Galicia. 
Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but anyways, following his surgery, Joseph offered James a job as a caretaker on his ranch and James has lived there ever since. Eventually, James remarried to a lady named Teresa Rivers and as far as I can tell, he's retired and happy still living in Kansas with his new wife. I'm sure you've heard of other wrongfully convicted people who when they get out of prison, they get some sort of financial compensation for their time and basically damages against them from the state. James never received anything like that. In 2008, he filed a claim under Florida's wrongful conviction law, which provides compensation for imprisonment of $50,000 a year. And if he would have won that, that would mean that the state of Florida would owe James just over $1 million. But the claim was denied because it requires a proof of innocence and there was no DNA evidence in this case. He was convicted solely on circumstantial evidence and eyewitness testimonies. So there's just really not any solid proof he didn't commit it, but there's also not any proof saying he did commit the crimes. Therefore, James was ineligible for this money. Then in 2014, Florida Governor Rick Scott signed House Bill 227 into law, which provides compensation to a wrongfully incarcerated person who was convicted and sentenced prior to December 31st of 1979. So basically this law is so restricted that the only person who would even qualify for it is James Richardson. And he was expected to be awarded $1.2 million, but as of 2015, he still has not received any money. Okay, I cannot find my lash glue. I'm pretty sure my cats made it into a toy, so we're just gonna go with my natural lashes today. They don't really look the best with this look, but it's fine. Okay, James did receive some financial compensation from the state of Florida but he only received $150,000 in a settlement from a lawsuit against DeSoto County for his wrongful pr prosecution, but pretty much all of the money went to his lawyers. So basically James really just has not received any any money for his 21 years he spent in prison. So in conclusion, James Richardson not only lost seven children, but he spent 21 years in prison, five of those on death row for a crime he did not commit and he lost everything because of this. He lost his wife, he lost his home, he lost the job he loved, he suffered mentally and physically. He credits his two heart attacks to not only the stress from losing his children and being accused of murdering them, but also from the poor quality of prison food and the poor health care he got while he was in prison. Basically, his whole entire life was completely ruined for nothing. And he's not received any kind of compensation for this. He no longer lives in Florida. Like I said, he lives in Kansas. But he did recently return to Florida, specifically to Arcadia, where he used to live. Most people in Arcadia still believe he is guilty and that he just got off. 1000% I believe this man was wrongfully convicted and that the babysitter was the one who murdered the children. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Do you think it was James or do you, do you also think it was the babysitter? Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe before you go. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in my next one. Bye!